Hello, women of welcome. I'm Sarah Casada, and today we're going to be talking with Jessica Cadeau about refugee families and their experiences resettling in the U.S. For those of you that are new to Women of Welcome, we are a Christian community of women pursuing compassion and Christ-like welcome towards immigrants and refugees. You are invited to join us on Facebook and Instagram at Women of Welcome. And for those of you looking for a safe place to ask sincere questions or dialogue with other women learning in the same space, we have a private Facebook group just for you, also called Women of Welcome. So we encourage you to find us there and go deeper with our community. But I am excited to introduce you to writer and advocate, Jessica Godot. She has spent more than a decade working with refugees in Austin, Texas, and is the author of this new book, After the Last Border, Two Families and the Story of Refuge in America. So good. I am a few chapters in and I'm like, just so excited to keep reading. So as we jump into this conversation, you guys feel free to drop any questions in the comments and we'll do our best to cover them. So Jessica, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so excited to be here, Sarah. I have loved your work for so long and I just think this is gonna be a really great conversation. Oh, thank you so much. This, this book you've written is just beautiful and it's based on real women that you spent significant time getting to know. So tell us a little bit I don't want to mispronounce their names, so I'm going to yeah. let you say their names. Tell us about them and how you first got connected to refugee, to refugee women and these women yeah. in particular. Yeah, so the women, they use pseudonyms in the book because their uh, relatives are still living in danger in both Myanmar and Syria, right? So I wanted this to be the kind of thing that, um, the, the kind of story that can show what it's like to be a refugee from a couple of different perspectives, but also I just worked with people whose stories I knew. So Muna and I have been friends. So she, Muna is from Myanmar. She is a Karen refugee. And that means that she and her, um, the people from her village and her um, family have been community are being persecuted in Myanmar currently because of their ethnicity, but also because of their religion. So most Karen refugees are Christians. Many of them are actually Baptist. Um, Baptist missionaries went over in the 1850s and converted several of the Karen refugees. And so their faith has passed down about as long as my own family's faith has been passed down. So this is not something that's like a kind of flash in the pan for them. This is like decades worth of Faith. And you'll see in the story her coming to her coming to faith through her husband's family. So she inherited from she she married into her husband. Like her story of faith is a really important and resonant part of this this whole book. So um, I didn't I didn't know that connection to Baptist missionaries. I will say my husband and I attended a Latino Baptist church for many years, and we had a Burmese congregation, mm -hmm. I believe, that met. Is Burmese also? Oh dear! Now I'm seeing geographically. Like right, I mean, right. Burmese is right. So yeah, it's in Myanmar, right? Questions, and this is important to answer. So the just to kind of get our language down a little bit, Burma is what the country used to be called. Um, oh, okay. is what the junta has changed the name to, which is actually the name that it was originally before the British colonialists change it to Burma. And so there's some debate about whether it's Burma or Myanmar. All of my friends still call it Burma and don't like calling it Myanmar because um, because the junta was the one that changed the name back, right? And oh, that's Hunza, fascinating. Yeah. So kind of, you can go either way. I've, I've heard some people that will only say Burma and some people that only say Myanmar. I've started saying Myanmar because people always correct me. And so I just think it's a little bit easier to go with that. But either of those, Myanmar is probably the correct term at this point, but either of those have been names for the country the whole time, right? Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't aware of that history and that connection. No. Oh, I, I learned all of this. This is what, so I met Muna in 2007 when she came over. She had just arrived. So the story begins with her arrival in the United States and I met her about six months afterwards. And though I'm not in the book, um, you get, we, we spent two years reconstructing the story, which is really in a lot of ways, us going back and filling in a lot of the details of our friendship, which was incredibly rich. So when I met her, she didn't speak English. She was pregnant with her third child. She um, was in the middle of a really complicated situation. And that was the first time I had ever met refugees. So I worked in Thailand for two years um, teaching English in the summer times when I was in college and I had traveled a little bit. So Sarah and I talked about this briefly beforehand. I crossed the border into Myanmar because I had a tourist visa and had to just like get that stamp to let me stay. And, um, but I'd never spent time there. And so when um, all these people walked in, I was with people at my church at a community center. It's a church that kind of operates as a community center in the neighborhood. And 
I was there to speak Spanish. This was not at all on my radar. And in walk all of these people that looked exactly like the kinds of people I had encountered in Northern Thailand. And I was mm -hmm. like, they're wearing the hand woven clothes and they're kind of squatting and they're spitting with the um, beetle juice seeds and they have the thanaka on their face. If anybody has been around um, Burmese refugees, often they'll put that kind of cornstarch looking stuff on their kids' faces to keep them from tanning. And I was just like, mm -hmm. What is happening? Like, how do people get <laughs> in, the in this neighborhood? And I think this is true for a lot of people that, in my experience, that encounter refugees. You just you meet somebody, you you get to know the community, and you kind of work together. So for me, this has felt like a really typical tale of because I became friends with Muna, and then there were several of us that wanted to help out and realized that there were a lot of women at home that didn't speak English and couldn't work because they had to be with their kids. A lot of the older women and young moms. We started a nonprofit working with Burmese refugee artisans. So they're all weavers and sewers, and they made dolls and bibs and bags. And for seven oh, wow. years, we helped them make supplemental income. And we finally finished our nonprofit when the last artisan got a full-time job. We gave, we combined all the resources and gave all the supplies and the last bit of money to the last two women who wanted to do it and helped them start their own businesses. And then, wow. That was it for me. I thought, well, you know, this has been such a rich time of my life. I've got these friendships and I went, moved on with my academic career and was running a writing center. And then all of a sudden people started talking about refugees in a way that was completely different from how we had ever talked about them before. So that's that's kind of how I got involved in writing the book. And then through the process of writing the book, I met Hasna, who was a Syrian refugee and had a completely different experience from Muna. I bet, I bet. Oh, well, it's, yes, the, it's funny. It's helpful, I think, to have that context because yeah. even as I was reading, I was like the detail of the experiences that you're describing for Muna as she's coming from the refugee camp and being resettled in the U.S. and just all the little details of even, you know, the noises she's hearing out of the, the window in her new apartment mm -hmm. and kind of what that experience is like for her because I, you know, I do think so often in immigrant and refugee conversations, um, something that often goes, I think, under discussed or under recognized is how many people are moving from very rural places and yeah. end up in U.S. cities. And yeah. just some of the very new experiences and kind of anxiety producing uh, noises and, and, and circumstances that come just even with living in a big city, which is often very unfamiliar. Yeah, I think that's the thing that I don't think, I mean, I, I didn't know this and it was, I was kind of, I often use the metaphor, um, it's almost as if Laura Ingalls moved to the United States of today, like moved through time in some ways. So Munat had not been in a car more than two or three different times in her life because her most of her experience was walking and then she spent several years inside of a camp. And so I think that was really surprising me when I began to get to know refugees in the first place. And there was a whole group of people that came over right around the same time that she did. And um, it was in part because Laura Bush went to a camp in Northern Thailand and really fell in love with a lot of the people there and did amazing advocacy work around making sure that people who'd been stuck in camps for a long time, especially persecuted Christians, had the opportunity to be saved. And so that was part of the, the story of Muna is that she was one of a huge wave of people that um, came to the United States and had really beautiful bipartisan support and a lot of women really advocating for um, persecuted Christians that kind of rallied around that group. So it was really a, a, a beautiful story at the time. Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. And giving a little bit of historical context to this. So we've talked in the Women of Welcome community before about the um, the refugee resettlement program and kind of the criteria for qualifying for refugee status, um, which is that you have, um, you know, proof of. Well, I'll let you explain. <laughs> Do you want to explain yeah. what what qualifies someone for refugee status? But but I also want you to touch on. Um, just the the history, particularly around the ship to Cuba. I had never heard that story until I read your book. And I was, I knew that I had heard the general concept, but I hadn't heard that story. So I'd love for you to share with that kind of background of the refugee resettlement program. Well, a couple of things that I think, a couple of terms I think are gonna be really helpful. And I'm, I'll just be really upfront about this. This for me is not a partisan book. It's not a, like, I'm not advocating for any political position. In fact, if anything, reading this book made me see that we need to have good communication. There have mm -hmm. always been two sides throughout history. So the history of the book really kind of goes back to the 1880s, though it's not deeply historical. I wanted this to be a like a 
the, a kind of digestible history. This is not a policy book. This is not, it's a story of our history instead of just like a deep history book, right? Like so if you're that. not a history person, don't be turned off by the fact that we have history. I wanted to- It reads to, like I, a novel. It really does. It reads like a novel. That was my hope. There are two different sides. There are the restrictionists and the liberalizers. And those were terms that I did not know and I found so fascinating. The restrictionists are saying we need to be safe. We can't just let everybody in. We have to think about do we have enough resources? Do we have enough you know, jobs? All of that stuff. The liberalizers are saying we need to let more people in. We're concerned about their safety. We don't understand what's happening around the world. And this debate has been going on since the beginning of our country. Mm -hmm. And the partisan sides of it have shifted a number of times. So part of what I tried to show in this is it's not as if it's always been, you know, one party on one side and one party on another. The Democrats in the 1920s and 1930s were the restrictionists because they were concerned. It was like high, a high union time. So they're really concerned about jobs, right? So understanding that uh, these two sides have been um, debating this, the history of refugee resettlement has been a balance between this conversation. So restrictionists have said, we have to only let in people who we know are safe and who really truly deserve this amazing program. And liberalizers have said, these are people in need and we need to make sure that we are helping them. And between the two of them, we created this beautiful, balanced, humanitarian program that has enjoyed bipartisan support, every president, every governor, really until the last few years. So this has, for me, never been about any particular person or any particular politician. This is about us recognizing the history of this in our country. That, you know, we can talk about immigration, the larger issue, but if we're gonna talk about refugee resettlement, this is something that has already been debated for so long, over so many decades. So the way that refugees- That's a good reminder. That's right? such a good reminder. It's, it, is, it has a long history yeah. of, and of, of people having, different viewpoints and there's and there's valid arguments in both ways and that's why you need that's why you need that discourse and you need that compromise to be able to figure out how to care for people well and and prioritize the things that are important for for all yeah, yeah. refugees and and as you know refugees that that are coming to the united states have a really secure background and i will be also very upfront in saying like i think we are actually too focused sometimes on security and there are a lot of people who deserve to come over through resettlement that are not able to come because of this so sometimes like the conversations when we that we have as if we've never thought about security are really frustrating for those of us who know what goes into it because i think almost we're like so hyper focused. I mean, in the interviews for this book, so Hazma is the name of the woman from Syria and her husband, Jibril, that's his pseudonym in the book. He was telling me a story one time about how um, the people came in and like their third interview for to be resettled and were like, so we know that your cousin in this village five years ago did this, this and this. And he, they were like, so what would your mom have to say about that? And he was like, uh, she's dead. You'd have to ask her. He thought this was the funniest joke and he would tell everyone. But like, he was like, how in the world could they possibly know details about you know these kinds of things i mean that what they do the vetting process is so, so extreme vetting yeah yeah for sure so i don't i don't want to miss the ship from cuba can you tell oh, that story I the ship from cuba. i'm so glad you reminded me okay so in the 1930s i found this story so fascinating and so painful at the same time in the 1930s 1939 there was a group of people that boarded the ms st louis and when they came to from uh germany to cuba in, in transit, the law changed in Cuba. And it's because there was this guy that had been basically like providing visas for money. And so he got a bunch of refugees out and said, you can come be safe in Cuba. And then the Cuban government caught him and said, you can't, um, this isn't gonna work. So by the time they, so it was really very similar to me to what happened with that executive order when people who had been in the process for years and had been told that they could be safe and their family members could come, like they'd done everything right they like on the plane it changed right and so i felt like there was such a resonance with these were refugees who were just trying to save their families from the holocaust and they showed up in cuba and cuba said sorry you can't get off i mean there are stories of like there was a dad with a rowboat begging the mom to like drop his son i still can't even talk about this drop his son to get into the ship just so that like off the ship just so they could save their baby right mm. so cuba didn't let him go and then they went to Miami and they were like literally telegraphing Eleanor Roosevelt, please say like, just take our children. And they didn't. And they sent the kids back to the Holocaust. So they were like 900, I can't remember the exact number, 900 something. And most of them 
ended up back in concentration camps. And since then, we have held, those of us who've heard the story have held that as, like, this is what happens when we don't let refugees in, right? Mm -hmm. But it was so clear because they were off the coast of Florida. I mean, they could see safety and they couldn't get to it. Sometimes we forget that that's what's happening around the world. When I published my book, the next day, I got a Facebook message from a guy in Iraq, and he sent me all of the papers. Like, I was translating for the U.S. government. I believe in the freedom of America. I am so convinced that this is what we want. Here's my baby. Here's my little girl who's got his little pigtail. She's so cute. And I've been turned down by the U.S. government, or I'm stuck in, he's stuck in the middle of this process. And he's somebody whose life is in danger because he was helping the U.S. government and I, the U.S. Army. And I... I think we don't see the people as viscerally as we did in that moment in the 1930s and recognize what's happening to people around the world. Yeah, that's a really interesting kind of comparison of this, this idea that you would get on a boat and the process changed by the time they arrived in Cuba. Yeah. And, you know, obviously there was some issues happening there with some, some fraud and different things, but also just that, yeah, visceral is the, the right word. It's such a human kind of, we got away, we, you know, we escaped this dangerous situation and now we realize we can't, um, you know, we can't dock anywhere. And um, I know that in 2017, the travel ban impacted both of the countries, I believe, where these women are from. Can you kind of share with us a little bit about how, how you've seen that play out yeah. in their, in their family stories? Yeah, so part, I don't want to give too much of the ending of Hosma's away, but I, it's yeah, like even absolutely. on the back of the book that she is, her family is deeply impacted by this. So um, part of what I was trying to do, especially with Hosma, is show, I wanted to go, so her story starts in Dara, Syria. She is, um, she is the mom of some amazing kids. She, she had just started having grandkids. And part of what I wanted to do was show not her experience as a refugee. So often those, these stories, like we act as if refugees, their their lives begin and end around their journey. Like it's a lot of like, there's someone in a boat or there's someone crossing the desert and that's kind of really definitive. When really that's a very tiny portion of most refugees life, right? The, the regular lives they had before and then off the very complicated lives they have after is, you know, like any of us, like it's, it's not like the saddest thing that happens to us that really defines us, right? Absolutely. So part of what I wanted to do was show you Hasna sitting drinking coffee after she got her kids off to school and what it was like for her as a mom and a grandmother who really cared about her family. She lived in a home that her family had been living in for generations and she is um, an amazing and really smart and really loving woman and a mother and a grandmother. And so her story is one of really just trying to keep her kids and her grandkids safe and together. If like her goal through the entire thing is just to keep them together. And I, you know, when we first began the interview process, um, we met every two weeks for two years and there was, it was me and a translator who speaks Arabic and Hasna. And so the three of us would have these meals and I could, I would eat the foods that she would make. So she, I would host it sometimes and I made some things and they're not nearly as good. Like I would, one time I made spaghetti squash and that was like the gourmet highlight of our whole thing. <laughs> but I didn't tell him that I like used the sauce from a jar cause I was running out of time. Like I was oh, like, man, <laughs> and they would show up and have these like elaborate homemade I mean I honestly ate my weight I, I probably gained five pounds in this interview process it was so good what and, what it, what motivated her because I is I know you had a, a long-standing relationship with Muna but what do you think motivated Hasna to share her story with you for the because that's an, an that's a intense intense. commitment yeah she wants people to know what it means to be a Syrian refugee mm -hmm. I mean it is like for her, this she she saw the the war in, in um, Syria started with some schoolboys in Dara. You know, it was just some people who their, their boys were tortured because they went out with chalk and wrote on a wall that the governor, I mean, that the president should be deposed because he was unjust. And they tortured the boys. And then her neighbors went out and protested. And then the government started bombing the city. I mean, it was just a. These are people that have that lived their lives under an impressive government and, and did their best. And all of a sudden everything hit the fan in a way that they could never have expected. And wow. she just kept saying, I just want people to know this isn't, you know, I think we always think a lot of Americans often think of Syria as a place of conflict and like those people, you know, who knows. And, and every interview I've ever done with anyone from Syria, they're saying, I'm, I'm sorry, they're using chemical weapons on our babies. Like, do you know what is happening? Our children are washing up on the shore in the world doesn't care. And so for her and mm -hmm. for the woman who translated and for every other Syrian I've talked to, they're so afraid of their families being in danger 
and they really, really deeply want people to understand what is at stake right now, right? Yeah. Oh, that is that is heavy work for her and for you um, to kind of go through that intensive. But I will say, even in just the part of her story I've already read, I really appreciate that that situating her in her home because I do think, and this is hardly a comparison, but I remember there was a moment earlier this spring when we started having you know toilet paper shortages and these kinds of things here in the states, and I remember walking into one of the um, like refrigerated aisles in the grocery store and it was completely empty. Yeah. And I remember having a moment of like, I feel like I have heard refugee people yeah. share their stories and it starts with these, obviously we are not in a refugee experience, but it was kind of this like this moment of like, everything was going along fine. And then yeah. these weird things started to change. Yeah. And next thing you know, we're involved in this conflict that is yeah. dramatically impacting our lives. And I remember in that moment thinking, I don't know that I've ever really sat and thought yes. thought about the reality that you were just living your life before all of this happened. Kind of what you said, like your story yeah. started with the journey and that's just simply not true. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I'm so glad you said that because I think that that's something that we're missing a lot. So yeah, you and I probably share the caveat of we're not refugees. Right. But I also, I've been using the phrase like this moment is an invitation to empathy for us, right? Like refugees also weren't refugees before they became refugees. So, you know, the things that are that we, you and I were talking before we started about like what's happening with virtual school and like there's so many things that are happening that those of us who are in the United States are really experiencing for the first time. Like who is telling the truth? Do do we trust the government? Do we trust news sources? Like we're having to kind of think critically about where we're receiving information. Mm -hmm. What's this going to cost our kids in terms of education? I have a really, you know, I have really smart kids and are they going to be behind? Um, how, how can I know like where the toilet paper is or kind of what, you know, all the strategizing we've had to do <laughs> on my neighborhood Facebook page. This yeah. is exactly what is, has been happening with refugees, right? Like they're WhatsApp groups of people who were like, here's a safe way out or here's what we're hearing. This is from a trusted person that is on the scene. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, here are some ways that you can school your kids, even in a camp, even when it's hard. Like there's so many ways that I keep coming back to. Like, just like you said, I've heard this story before and I didn't think that I would live it in some ways. And of course we're not because I don't think that any of us have the sense that we're going to have missiles dropped on our house or sure. you know, the ways in which like we, we have some expectations of going back to safety and privilege, but it, it gives us a, just a little taste of it in some really important ways. It's so good. Well, and that's a really great segue to, I wanted to ask because so much has changed since mm -hmm. your book was probably finished, even though it just mm -hmm. released, but I know there's that time in between when you wrote yeah. it. But COVID in particularly, how are you seeing that impact um, the women that you worked with and then refugee community at large kind of be impacted by what's been happening over the last six months? You know, one of the things that is the hardest, and you'll see this kind of throughout the book, is that Hasna's, Hasna's family worked as a, as a group. So Hasna and her kids and her grandkids really viewed themselves as like, and it, I love this because it reminds me so much of like how my grandparents generation really thought of themselves as like our family's going to work together. And so somebody was watching the kids while somebody else was kind of working and providing for everybody. And so their whole family unit's really a beautiful system. And so when you think about family separation, like some people are allowed to come here and then others are not. And again, I don't want to give too much away, but it has really impacted their ability to provide well for themselves. And so Hasna mm -hmm. um, is in a pretty complicated financial situation currently trying to make it because of COVID. So she's been furloughed. She had a she had what was a good job and was providing at least somewhat for their family. And now um, it's been really difficult for them. So Muna, I think is, um, you, and you'll see in the book, the story is a, a story of her really finding her feet and put, helping her family put down roots in some incredibly amazing ways. And I, um, I, I see that, I think that that has continued to play out. She's back at work and, and doing okay. I think that we're not recognizing it's so hard right now to get, there's so much news, there's so much noise, there's so many people talking that we're not recognizing the impact, you know, for a lot of us who I feel consumed some days by like how hard this time period is for us. Mm -hmm. and, and then I listen to my former refugee friends and think like, this is nothing. They were already vulnerable because of what happened to them. They came over for, to be resettled and, and we're vulnerable still. And this has really impacted a lot of people. So I was doing a lot of interviews in April and May with people and um, who work at like Tyson's food and different food processing mm -hmm. plants, which is mm -hmm. a lot of hotel service industries and a lot of the places that have really been affected by this uh, employ former refugees. So it's a time and resettlement agencies used to, you know, they're, they're 
the number of re the number of refugees affects their funding, right? So they get funding based on how many people are coming. So the less refugees that come, the less able they are to kind of help meet the needs of people. So people, refugees abroad are in really dire straits because if you're in a camp and COVID comes, I mean, man, I, I can't even imagine how complicated this is. And then refugees here, it's so dire. And it's also so frustrating because I think people don't really want to talk about it. I'm, I, I have a hard time trying to get publications to publish about it, right? Like I keep, I feel like I'm like screaming into the void, like this is really bad for people and it's so hard to get people to care. Yeah, you make an excellent point. And I know that's something we've seen uh, over the last couple of years as our um, limit of how many refugees the US is going to allow in each year, which is called the refugee ceiling, is that has been lowered and is currently at a historic low, I believe it's 18,000. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. Resettlement agencies receive their funding often based on those numbers. And so we've seen them closing closing their doors. Um, I know here in Atlanta where I live, we've seen refugee resettlement agencies close. And the, the, the timing of knowing that refugees are in unique need of support during COVID yeah. as well is really, really unfortunate. And I think it's an, I hope it will be an opportunity for churches mm -hmm. and communities to step in that gap yeah. and, and um, you know, really come around their neighbors um, who have these unique stories and be able to, to support them in ways that, that are meaningful, so. Yeah, and I think maybe that's something that when we, when we think about the history, it's a history of our country, but I think it's really important to understand that this is a history of people of faith. We have, mm -hmm always rallied around refugees until the last five years. And for those of us who came from, I mean, I, I went to Abilene Christian University, like my bona, my bona fides are, are pretty serious, you know? And when we, when we start thinking about this, like this isn't for me a conversation that's like, these, this is what those people need to do. These are, this is, these are my people mm -hmm. who raised me with deep values to care for people who were vulnerable, right? Like I read the Bible and it is so clear God's heart for those who are in vulnerable situations. Yeah. And yet somehow we've missed that. Like we allowed this partisan rhetoric to really shift things or we think like, and maybe it's always been this way. I was, I was fascinated to learn that more refugees are where we settled under Republican president since the 19th, since the um, refugee act passed in 1980 than under democratic president. So it's almost always been um, something that was understood to be like led by people of faith. So this was, the, we have always had, this has like always been who we were. And so I think it's going to really take people of faith stepping up again and saying, we refuse to allow vulnerable people to continue to be talked about this way and to be put in these situations. You know, we, there's a lot of people like to talk about anti-trafficking. Refugee resettlement is one of the answers because children are often trafficked when they're being smuggled across, going with smugglers across the border or stuck in camps without any way out. So if people care about anti-trafficking, refugee resettlement is a great way to ensure that children are brought to safety. If we care about family separation, the, that's exactly what's happening right now because families are not able to be together. So I think sometimes we think about these as like really separate categories and really it's it's not one person, it's not one party. This is a larger conversation that we as people of faith really need to rally around. Yeah. And I want to clarify too, when you when you can you talk a little bit about more about what you mean by family separation when yeah. it comes to the refugee conversation? Because I think, you know, many women in our community were very engaged and concerned in 2018 when we talked about family separation happening at the southern border, which right. was a little different than yes. this type of refugee yes. or refugee family separation. So maybe you can share a little bit about that. Sure. You know, I think it's interesting because I think sometimes we rally around a story that we can really see, right? And so like that story that you brought up earlier about the, the, the boat of Holocaust survivors right off the coast of Florida, like that was a really visceral moment where we're like, they're here, these people, right? I think that that's what happened with uh, children crossing the border is like, it, I mean, I, there was a camp that was happening near, they, they set up a camp near Abilene. Like this felt really personal for me because my, my you know, my relatives could drive out and see what was happening. And so we could see it in ways that I think are, I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that there was such a rally around it. I think that that was a really important issue for people to say, like, we're not going to let kids be separated from their parents. And I did a lot of interviews and, you know, I don't talk about this very often, but I, had, I have a daughter who was adopted, who has gone through some, we, we've had a lot of conversations about trauma. And so for me as a mom, I still can't, I really can't even talk about like the trauma that was happening to children. 
knowing that we didn't have to inflict this trauma on children and seeing in my own personal life what that's like it is yeah. it's gut-wrenching right and so but because of that the same sort of issues are happening with people who are not able to be together so a core pillar of our immigration policy since 1965 when lyndon b johnson had the um immigration and nationality i can't remember the ina then the act internet immigration nationality act mm -hmm. i should know this stuff i'm not a policy person but anyway the big <laughs> act in 1965. so he um he just basically said like we believe that families should be together and that's a mm -hmm. that's a core part of who that was a founding was. principle yep yes exactly founding principles are really good way to put it yeah <laughs> and, and so refugee resettlement has always been based on that right like if somebody comes here then their family members should be able to join them and they should be able to be together as a family it's just really basic and somehow in the last few years, and again, this is not just about any one person, this has been across the board in a variety of conversations, political and otherwise, that's become chain migration. And I am so frustrated and confused by that. I Again, I think whenever you say to someone, I think families should be together, they say, that makes sense to me too. So I don't, I don't understand why this is something that has become um, so polarizing, right? So I, I believe firmly that Hasna should be able to be with her kids and her grandkids because it's important for families to be together. And if, if I could show you pictures of Hasna's grandbabies, I mean, <laughs> okay, oh, this little one that is so like, I'm, I'm with, I love the pictures of the kids with pigtails. I've talked to about two different kids, <laughs> They're so gorgeous, right? They're like little pixie babies. And Hasna is her kids. The only way that she's seeing her grandbabies grow up is over what on Facebook, right? They FaceTime constantly and yet she can't be with him and i'm telling you right now if if somebody kept my mom away from her grandbabies my mom would claw her way across the desert to get to them right and so how can we think that these parents would do anything less and so part of what's happening with refugee resettlement right now this is about family separation because so many of the people that were in line to be resettled have family members here yeah. including several children from myanmar who were left with relatives their families came over and then they petitioned to bring their children over so we have children who can't join their families and grandparents and mm -hmm. it really is just like it's like a a knife that was chopped in the middle of these family relationships and what mom or grandmother is going to be like i'm so glad to be here and i'm really enjoying my life in the united states my kids are in danger and they might be bombed or they, my grandbabies are starving but i'm doing great of course they're not feeling that way of course mm -hmm. they're desperate to bring over their family members right yeah no that makes lots of sense um we have a couple questions in the comments that i want to um raise and if you don't know the answer to this that's okay mm -hmm. But um, Diana asked about some of the differences between the U.S. refugee resettlement program and the Canadian yeah. system, which allows um, families to essentially petition for refugee family. It's more of a direct process like that. Do you write about that in the book? Is that something that you've researched and could share? So what, what is she saying that families that families petition for families to come over? Um, so you can you can ad kind of adopt a refugee family in the Canadian system, and so like a church or a or a or a family a Canadian family can petition to sponsor a refugee family. Yeah, and yeah. just curious, you know, kind of I don't know if you know the history of the Canadian system, but it is interesting to think about you know other other ways countries address that and if there's opportunities for that in the states or what that would look like i don't know the specifics of the canadian system in terms of adopting a family to come over i do know that, that was a part of how the u.s did it for a while and oh, no. then we stopped part of it was part of like a, the quota system and it wasn't exactly the same way u.s refugee resettlement used to be kind of an ad hoc system of like who who came over was based as much in terms of like how we felt about people as um, what was actually happening and so part of why we moved to the refugee resettlement i'm not saying this is what canada is doing by the way mm -hmm. part of why we moved to the the federal regulated refugee resettlement program is because we wanted it to be less like i know somebody and they're in danger so they should come um at the same time i know that canadian the canadian resettlement is they, they are literally currently resettling more refugees than the united states and they have a population a tenth the size of us and so um what has been really fascinating is watching them take on world leadership in terms of welcoming people and i think that they've they've done a great job in, in my opinion from what little i know of having um conversations that can still be i don't not bipartisan but like coming from a bunch of different angles in order to have a great conversation about what it means to be people who welcome and so i think we really could learn a lot as much about um, 
Canada's rhetoric as we can their policy. So I'm not exactly, I'm not sure how to answer that from a policy perspective. No, that's totally fine. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, and I think it's, it's worth repeating that, you know, our refugee resettlement program has traditionally had strong public support, strong bipartisan support. And you mentioned in the book about kind of the connection to what's happening with, um, what's happening with our refugee resettlement and how it speaks to kind of the heart of the country yeah. at any given moment. Can you speak to that just a little bit? You know, I mean, it's, it's easy for a lot of us right now to feel um, really cynical and like those people, you know, or those people in Washington or those people across the political aisle or like we kind of put each other in groups. Right. And so, for me, I'll just be totally honest, for me, researching and writing this book was really healing in some ways and it gave me hope in a way that I really did not expect. I truly did not expect to, to come out of this thinking like, there's a chance that we could do better. I fell absolutely in love with the refugee resettlement program and I did not expect to write a love letter to a federal program. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, but I love I love that you said that and I think this is true for so many of us as things get further and further away relationally, we get more cynical, we get yes. more ragey, we get more um, upset, but when you connect with real people, there's hope yeah. in that. That's really beautiful. I'm sorry, you were still talking no. about it. I love yeah, that. And part, of it, and part of it is because this is not the first time we've been in this place. And so I think for me, I just keep thinking like, what has happened? It has never been like this before. And it really has. And so the 1920s and 1930s were as polarizing, as separated a time as it's possible to have. That's when the Ku Klux Klan was really coming into they were like coming into its own, like early 1920s. This is not in the book, but the, I'm researching some other stuff. And I was like, oh, there were some like a lot of just kind of violence and other stuff. It connects with a lot of what's happening in terms of the civil unrest around the country. Like this real question, like who we are as a country, we mm -hmm. have this, this boils up every few decades, every few generations. And so mm -hmm. what we're in, though it's unique to our particular time period, this is not a unique conversation, right? It's a little bit like parenting a teenager and being like, we don't fight all the time, but it's often the same kind of like this conversation. I feel like the U.S. is sort of a teenager in that sense, like <laughs> really wrestling with who we are as a country, right? Yeah. And so I, for me, what was so wonderful that, that I'm so glad you brought up the 1930s situation because we literally turned people away. And at the time there was this one man that he, he's the one that made up the word genocide. And I don't want to get too much into all of this, but there was like one guy who's, there were like 30 people from his family that were killed in Poland. And he literally was like knocking on doors and begging people and doing all this stuff. And I really, I, I didn't end up including much about him in the book, but I read a lot about him and thinking like how incredibly painful must this have been for people in the 1930s and 40s to say like, you have to see what's going on. You have to see it. And then right after World War II and like a five or six year period, everything changed for refugees and like around the world, but the US was a big leader in that. And so I have hope mm. that those of us who continue to advocate and continue to have conversations with people around us and continue to all the number of ways that we're, that we're advocating for change, that this is going to create the kind of groundswell that can lead to some real shifts that are, that are necessary, that mm. our immigration system does need to be reformed. It would be wonderful if we didn't have resettlement under the president so that it just kind of continues to steadily go on and on, right? And so we shouldn't have these dips and, and waves based on public opinion, right? Yeah, that's interesting. No, that's fascinating. And I love that you're kind of leading us to the end here with this sort of hopeful vision yeah. for we can ride this through. And I'll, I'll ask you one last question, kind of one that we talk a lot about in our community, which is what does Christ-like welcome mean yeah. to you? Yeah. You know, it does not mean that we... Um, it means that we are clear about our values. So I was raised Church of Christ, and there are, you can criticize Church of Christ for a lot of things. I, I'm, I'll be the first one, we had some weird views on, you know, whether or not you were going to hell if you played a guitar. That was like my grandparents, right? But one of the things that they did really well was raise me to be countercultural, right? So my view was, hmm. and, and still is, I, this is still a big important part of who I am. I read scripture, and I see that God calls us to welcome people, no matter their skin color, no matter where they come from, no matter if they're Samaritan, no matter if they're outsiders, no matter who they are, right? Like it is not my place to only allow people who look like me or people who believe like me or people who have my same worldview to be on top. And I think 
again, this is not about a particular party. This is about me recognizing that um, God has called us to be countercultural and to be welcoming of strangers and people who have been put in vulnerable situations because of war. You know, the whole widows and orphans thing is really about people who are marginalized in society. And those are at the forefront of what God calls people to do. And so I think those of us who, who care about this have to continue pushing. We cannot be caught up in any political rhetoric. We cannot be caught up in any kind of partisan worldview. We have to keep ourselves thinking through this lens in a way that allows us to think critically about whatever it is that we're receiving from news or from neighbors or whatever it looks like. And we have to keep those vulnerable people at, at the forefront of what we're, of what we're advocating for. Oh, I love that. I love that reminder that, that welcoming may be countercultural. Yeah. That, that's, that that's really, and, and in our invitation to welcome may not always fit into what everyone wants or expects of us, yeah. but we are invited to invite and, and that, that that is really a countercultural posture. I, mm -hmm. I love that reminder. That's really, really great. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for your time, for your book, sharing your story. Um, and we thank Munan Hasna from afar for them sharing their stories with us because it is really um, just a great book. And I want to thank everyone who joined us live. And I'm going to show this picture of Jessica's book. So if you um, are interested in reading more, um, again, it reads like a novel, but you'll learn so much along the way. And so don't forget to get a copy of that. And you can connect with Women of Welcome on Facebook, including our private group and Instagram at Women of Welcome. We are about creating life changing welcome and you are always invited. So thank you all for joining us. We'll talk Thanks to you later. Later. Bye, Jessica.